Why did you want to write this book? Nobody had done what a historian would do when they approach a biography, which is go into archives, delve into public records, interview uh, people who are kind of, you know, in the corners of history, and create a, a newly resonant and deep, uh, deeper history. We're learning about things that maybe fundamentally shaped him, but that he never knew about. Or we're hearing about events that he perceived in one way and other people perceived in a different way. What did you find out about Richard Pryor's grandmother? In digging through the newspapers of Decatur where she grew up, I discovered that there was this incident where in 1929, she heard that a black boy, probably uh, one of her um, own children, had been slapped at a candy store by the white owner of the candy store. And what she did kind of beggars the imagination. She went in there with some sort of cudgel. She started wailing on the woman's head. She opened up a flesh wound. The woman ran out screaming. And Marie Pryor held her ground. She stood in the confectionery as if, I'm just waiting for the police to come. The police acted as if a bank had been robbed. They sent five policemen to subdue her. And she just stayed there and held her ground. And then, in fact, when it went through the court, she actually pressed charges against the confectionery owner and said that the confectionery owner was the one guilty of assault, not her. This is a really remarkable woman, a, a, a poor black woman, a working class black woman, doing what very few uh, people would have done in that situation. How do you use Richard Pryor's life to teach about history? We see Richard Pryor begin in Peoria when it's a sin city. He's growing up in the heart of its red light district. And then Peoria changes. It becomes, wants to rebrand itself as this all-American city in the 50s. His red light district where he grew up is targeted for demolition. They put a freeway through it and a bridge. It's urban renewal. He needs to move to a new part of town. What do you know? It's a white part of town. And so suddenly when he's giving his first performances as a comedian, he's doing it to his white classmates. This is such a profound thing in terms of what uh, his sense of himself as a comedian. From Peoria, he leaves there in the 60s. Where does he land? New York City, Greenwich Village, just as, you know, it's in the moment of the kind of flourishing of Bohemia. And it continues on through when he comes to the Sunset Strip, to Hollywood, Berkeley, and so on. He's traveling through history, even as he's changing history, through the force of his art and the force of his creativity. What was important about Pryor's life in Berkeley? By 1971, when Pryor settled in Berkeley, he had basically run into a wall in terms of his life as a comedian. He didn't like the kind of crossover comedy he was doing. And what he found in Berkeley was the freedom to experiment, uh, especially the freedom to be unfunny. And so if we look at what he was doing when he was in Berkeley, he's creating uh, screenplays for guerrilla filmmaking. He's creating sound collages that are uh, against police and prison brutality. Uh, he's doing new kinds of stand-up that are almost more like off-off Broadway theater, experimental. So he's freed to let his imagination go w wherever it will. And that has a huge impact on the comedian he becomes after he leaves Berkeley, the fearless Richard Pryor, who changes every genre uh, that he takes on. You created a website to go with the book, becomingrichardpryor.com. It curates over 200 documents that are related to Richard Pryor's formative years. It's everything from things that are very personal, his school records, family photos, legal records of his family when they got in trouble with the law, larger social issues that touched on his life so much, like the question of how segregated Peoria was. It curates all these different uh, documents, and the reader or the visitor can flow in and out of them as they wish.